Okay, we're going to take a look at how we create a basic project and uh, Code Warrior for our Quick Stick. Um, as of this video, we're using Code Warrior 10.1. So I've just launched it, and uh, the first thing it brings up is this workspace launcher. Um, a workspace in Code Warrior uh, is simply just an area um, in a folder that contains some metadata um, about your projects you have in that workspace and uh, some, some global settings as well. Um, you may actually have actual project data in there, actual C code files, um, but in many cases your workspace can have references to those files that exist somewhere else, not necessarily in the workspace. So uh, this is a general concept too in what's called Eclipse. Code Warrior is based upon an open source framework developed by IBM called Eclipse. Um, it's used by a lot of different vendors of microcontrollers uh, to make their own IDEs so they all kind of work common and they share the same kind of features. Um, so Freescale also now uses Eclipse. So uh, many of the th things you're going to learn about Code Warrior kind of applies to any Eclipse environment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, yes, we're going to open this workspace. Code Warrior is going to boot up. Um, and I'm going to see a blank screen here. Uh, over on the left is my workspace viewer. I have no projects in my workspace, so the first thing I'm going to do is create one. So I will go to File, New. Uh, what we want is a bareboard project. That's for creating what's called a bare metal application, meaning there's no operating system, there's no nothing except exactly what we need to kind of make the microcontroller work. So we want a bareboard project. I'll call it Quick Stick Test. And by default, it wants to put the whole folder, the whole project inside of my workspace. We could unclick this and um, pick some other place in the hard drive, but for now, we'll just put it in our workspace. It doesn't have to be, but we can. So click Next. Uh, we have to select the processor that we're using in this bareboard project. It has to know to set up the linker file correctly to make sure that it uses the correct, correct memory and flash ranges. So uh, I just know by looking through the Quick Stick documentation, it uses the K4256 VMD100 variant. So I'll click Next. Um, I also know from the data that the debugging uh, connection it uses a Seeger JLink. It's built on the board. The open source JTAG is um, a system that's built onto a lot of other tower boards. Uh, the multi-link is made by Peony Micro, and uh, it's kind of a commercial product. But the Seeger J-Link is what we have on our board. Uh, for now, I'm not going to add any uh, files to the project. Um, I'm just going to have it create kind of like a d default main.c uh, file. We're using C, the C programming language. There are some options for it to have it like auto initialize certain peripherals using the device initialization and some the processor expert gives some um, example code for setting up uh, the peripherals as well. Uh, we're not going to use any of that. We want to look at the most basic project available. So we'll click finish. It's going to think for a minute. And then you notice over on the left it brings up the uh, quick stick project. Now what I'm going to do is drag over into this window inside of my workspace. You notice I also now I have this quick stick uh, folder. And inside here there's a bunch of files with XML and all this metadata that kind of have stuff that's about my project. Now in the view in the uh, uh, window in Eclipse here, it also kind of mirrors that folder. It doesn't show you some of the metadata, but it does certainly reflect files and folders. So we're just going to take a look to get used to what's in here. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is the sources folder. This directly mirrors in the file system where the project's at, whatever's in the sources folder. So, so be careful. If you delete it here, it's deleted in your workspace, and vice versa. Anything you do in your workspace view happens in the local file system. So um, the first thing we'll do is the main.c is just the main application and uh, we'll see here's a simple example it makes a counter variable. Um, it has a printf routine. What's kind of cool with the uh, debugger is that when you do a printf it magically comes to the debugger in a little window in your uh, in your uh, debug window. It's not extremely fast but it is a way of getting some data out in this example, it just increments the count in the core. 
Now, let's take a look at some of the other files that are floating around. So you will generally want to put all your source code in the sources file. You don't have to, but uh, you, you can. Um, the headers file has any include files that we might want to use. And the project headers is also on your hard drive is just a direct mirror of it. Now all the Freescale uh, projects get set up, it always creates this file called derivative.h. So if we just poke in derivative.h, it's kind of like a pointer file that derivative.h always includes the device header file uh, for whatever you're using. So even if you created a project for another uh, microprocessor, there would be a derivative.h, but it would point to the header file for that device, whether it's HCS08, the cold fire. So what we can do is probe in that file. And it'll give you a warning. This is a big file. Um, now what this has, and it's kind of cool, it has nice defines and enumerations for interrupt IRQ numbers, for all of our registers, uh, and whatnot. So later on, we're going to take a look at um, you know this file in more detail. But basically, every register that you see in the data sheet, there's something defined in this header file. So you don't have to know its absolute address. You just kind of use this header file. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of point it out. If you include derivative.h, it includes this file, um, and you can get to it. Now, here's kind of a cool feature in Eclipse. If you just control click on an include file, it'll always take you to that file. So I'll control click again. Um, and it kind of took me inside here, and uh, uh, we can kind of go from there. So uh, it's kind of a neat way of, of, of you know finding where stuff's at. There is over in the left hand this outline view where it kind of shows you the outline of any particular file. So it shows me that there's a main function, a derivative of h. Now there's one other place I, I want to kind of pull your attention to is this project settings. It kind of has some other lower level files that you need uh, for, for, for using in a project. The first is this startup code. This kinetisys in it has a very important function. Um, it sets up the interrupt vector table. So the vector table is just a table of functions that kind of exists just so whenever you get an interrupt, the processor knows what function to execute when they get that interrupt. It could be a timer, or a serial port. This is by default, after boot up, where you put function names. So you notice you see all these function names called unassigned ISR. Well, the unassigned ISR is just defined with a macro as ISR default, which up here is just something. What they do is they just populate the table with this default ISR, so if you don't have it defined, it'll go somewhere, and it makes debugging a little bit easier. So later on, when we look at some interrupt code examples, uh, we've got to populate this table um, and use it, but I just want to make sure you know that a lot of the example code that uses interrupts kind of needs this file, and you got to kind of know that it's in this startup code uh, folder. So if we look in our project, it's in the project settings startup code. Let me hide this. Uh, the other thing that's kind of useful to know about are the linker files. The linker files are what the linker uses when it finally has to, after it does the compilation process, it actually has to locate all the code in RAM or ROM and kind of figure out where to put variables. Well, there's two different, that's what the linker file is used for. Well, there's actually two different variants. There's one called RAM and Flash. The RAM is set up by default where it takes all your code and uh, everything and stuffs it all in RAM. Um, what that means, though, if all your functions RAM, as soon as your processor uh, power gets removed, uh, it all goes away and you have to reload the code. The flash linker file will put variables in RAM, but anything that all your functions will get stored in the flash, so it's sticky. It'll, it'll be there after a power cycle. Now, one thing that we have I want to point out is the way you select which one you want to use is with a build configuration. So under project, build configurations, and set active. I'm going to change to the flash. I like using the flash. Um, and now we're set up to do that. So what you can do is if we just want to compile this code as is, we just go to project. We say build all. And there we go. So down at the bottom here is this problems window. If we could kind of see there's a console, it'll kind of look at what kind of gets executed a command line. 
if ha there have many problems it would tell us here. And you notice there's actually an output folder now called internal flash. And inside there, the .afx file is a binary file that gets loaded on the chip. Um, so that's a basic project setup here. Um, and uh, basically the most basic example uh, and some things I just want to be aware of. So just kind of remember you have this header file that defines all of the registers inside of this variant of the Kinetis. Uh, but you also have the sysinit file that has your vector table. So as you get kind of along your code, you want to interrupt vectors. Well, you have to have a, uh, uh, a function that gets called whenever uh, the, the interrupt gets set. Well, that's where you kind of that, uh, put the function name. So we'll look at more detail later how you actually use this. But I just want to know that it's there, and you may need to uh, know where it's at for some other example code. So that's it for this video. Um, in the next video, we're going to take a look at compiling this example and uh, just some basic features of the debugger. So I'll see you later.